the Fed will not pivot and not create more liquidity until there's at least a 30 or 40 percent drawdown in the markets. In my opinion, they'll wait for real pain before they quote unquote revert back to stimulus. So in my opinion, it's not a time to chase these markets now. Wait till there's at least a 30 percent reversion. Then the Fed will come in and like March of 2020, you'll get the buying opportunity of, of a lifetime. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart. Thanks for joining us for part two of our interview with monetary expert Matt Pippenberg. If you haven't yet watched part one of this discussion with Matt, in which he warns that the vast and fast multiplying amount of global debt will inevitably cause the destruction of the purchasing power of the world's major currencies, head over to our channel at youtube.com slash wealthion and watch it there first. It sets the context for the investment themes we discuss in this video. Okay, let's get started watching part two of our interview with Matt Pippenberg. Right. What assets are you looking at right now, given what you see coming? And, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but having read your article, it, it does seem like you think that there are short-term disinflationary and deflationary risks heading probably oh, yeah. as we get to you know, the lag effect causing some things to crack and a market correction as a result of that and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So there, there may very well be, uh, you know, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, downward price destruction before we get this big oh, rescue that then shoots things to the moon. Oh yeah, no, it's, you know, it's, um, it's an important question. And again, a lot of criticisms, you know, there's so many different types of investors that are watching this. I can't give one answer because it's what, what I would tell my daughter, what I would tell my father are different advice. Right. Uh, what I would tell, uh, you know, some people who are active traders don't even want my advice because they, they look at things differently. At 30,000 feet, the first thing I'd have to distinguish before I give any specific advice is what type of investor are you? Are you uh, a preservation focused investor or a growth focused or somewhere in the middle. Many criticisms of folks like me, because I'll be blunt, I am not looking for growth anymore. You know, you've heard the joke, how do you make a small fortune? You inherit a large fortune. Right. To me, the, the key to remaining wealthy is not to lose money. I'm at that point by luck or crook that I'm not interested in trying to double my money every year in the markets. I had that mentality in my 20s and 30s and I got lucky. And now I just want to preserve. So I have a different bias. I'm the boring gold, precious metals guy, like many of our clients, whose main focus right now is just preserving. I understand the criticism that, hey, Matt, that's great, but there's many of us who need to grow and beat inflation. So how do I how do I position myself? If you're not already a trader, because I know people that, like I said, who just do one thing, if they go long and short Tesla, that's their career. They can make a lot of money by following exit and entry signals, Bollinger Bands, Keltner Bands, DMARC indicators, you know, sector rotation scales. It's very complex. You can't give that kind of advice over the air because it requires years of experience. Right. So for many of your viewers, I would understand they're relying then on their advisors. And my point is, so with your advisor, the first thing I would say, again, I'll repeat it over and over, get the heck out of a, of a risk parity portfolio of diversified stocks and diversified bonds because they're correlated. I would also check with your advisor, what is the benchmark? Is the benchmark the S&P for your portfolio or an absolute return of say eight to 10% to beat inflation? Because the answer your advisor gives tells you the type of mentality he or she has. Because just benchmarking the S&P is too easy. That means when the s and is down 30 and you're only down 20, that's victory. So again, look at how your advisor, if you're not actively trading yourself, how does your advisor look at risk? What really is the hedge? My opinion, my advisor, if I were going to advise her right now, I'd want one who knows how to go long and short and hedge. That's very generic advice. But I'd also want an advisor right now who sees a topping market and is more interested right now in waiting for mean reversion because I do see an uh-oh moment. Don't know when, could be nine months from now or nine weeks from now, but I would want a portfolio that doesn't have to time that, that is already hedged enough right now, mostly in cash equivalents. Like Ray Dalio and others, I, mean, I think even, gosh, Jeremy Grantham, I mean, a GMO, they're heavily in cash equivalents in short-term or short-duration treasuries because they're not looking to top out right now or to chase the top. They understand the old adage, buy low and sell high, that almost no one does. But I, I don't see a lot of alpha right now in just going long a few sectors. I think, as I've said before, if you want to buy low and sell high, you've got to have the patience like a Jim, uh, you know, 
I would actually say a Rick Rule or a, a Ross Beatty. These guys have long-term horizons. Mm -hmm. There is clearly, as Ronnie Sterfula has shown, a cycle, an inverse relation between commodities and equities in the S&P. Right now, commodities are cheap. It's value. But they can be very volatile and stomach churning for short duration thinkers, short term investors. If you're a longer term thinker and you're looking and you have the time and the patience to wait it out, you could go into an allocation to commodities, 10, 15 percent commodities, a much larger allocation to short duration treasuries to try and at least keep up with inflation. My advice is to wait for a mean reversion and buy low. In any sector in the equity markets, I would stay away, as Lou Groman says, from long duration treasuries and long duration sovereigns. They're just not giving you return free risk anymore. They're giving, I mean, risk free return. They're giving you return free risk. So, again, it's commodities, it's cash equivalents, it's patience, and it's waiting for mean reversion. You could argue that there'll never be a mean reversion in the markets because the Fed will just print money to keep markets always up and above the nose level of the water level, but the Fed will not pivot and not create more liquidity until there's at least a 30 or 40% drawdown in the markets, in my opinion. They'll wait for real pain before they, quote unquote, revert back to stimulus. So in my opinion, it's not a time to chase these markets now. Wait till there's at least a 30% reversion. Then the Fed will come in. And like March of 2020, you'll get the buying opportunity of, of a lifetime. So if you're 70 or 80 years old, though, and you can't wait for a mean reversion and you can't sit in cash forever, it doesn't mean you should be chasing tops. So it's very complex. And again, it goes to, are you looking for growth? Are you trying to preserve? What's your age level? What's your tolerance? It sounds like I'm trying to avoid the question, but really for me, I like to buy low and sell high. I'd rather get a commodity, more commodity focused portfolio, not just gold, not just silver. I'm talking commodities, hard assets um, while they're cheap and have the patience to wait many years. My daughter who's 28 can do that. Some of your viewers don't have the patience, or maybe they do. I, I don't want to presume. I think to be chasing tops when you're not actively trading means you then have to ask your advisor, well, what are you doing then to protect against risk and capture some alpha? It's very hard to capture alpha in these markets unless you know how to go long and short. It's that simple. You need active management right now. If you're relying on a third-party advisor, you need active management. And as we said last time, and I'll, and I'll, I'll pound my fist again and again, Get managers whose first protocol is managing risk, not promising projections, because this is not a market, in my opinion, that offers a lot of alpha right now on the long side. There's just too much downside risk. And I have been bearish for years, but I've always found opportunities in the markets long and short if you know what you're doing. And there were moments like in March of 2020 where I was as bullish as you could be when I saw the Fed starting to go into unlimited QE. And I'm as cynical about the Fed. But when you get a signal like that, it's full speed ahead, full gas down long equities. Right now is not the time to be doing that. Wait until there's that dip that requires Fed pivoting or Fed liquidity, whatever they want to call it. That's your opportunity. Your managers should be holding in cash until that opportunity comes, in my opinion. I think to be chasing tops and buying the narrative that these are resilient markets, that labor is strong, that a soft landing is here. Let's go long and hard the S&P. That's crazy. As we've just talked about for the last hour, it is not a soft landing. The labor market is not resilient. And we have a debt-based system that is going to need more stimulus from the Fed. And that stimulus will come only after the markets cry uncle and start puking. That doesn't mean you short the S&P and time that. Wait for it to start puking. Buy that dip when the Fed is stimulating the recovery. And, and that's my plan. So in the meantime... I, I stay out of it. I'm mostly in cash equivalents, got some commodity exposure, and I preserve the wealth I have through gold, not because gold rips. It's only because currencies get weaker. And even gold goes down when markets go down. They're very commiserate in the first six to eight weeks. That's nothing new. But I, I am less sexy giving investment advice now because my primary goal is preserving what I have, not trying to grow it. It doesn't mean I don't respect people who are trying to grow their wealth right now. These are very hard markets to do that in when they're topping and they're not getting the support of the Fed yet. But they will. But that won't come until after markets take a nosedive first. All right. Does that make sense um, to you, Adam? No, absolutely. Very well said. Um, and, you know, on, on every one of these videos, um, I, I make a little I have a little diatribe near the end where I. <laughs> recommend that most people watching work under the guidance of a good professional financial advisor yeah. in general, uh, because most people don't have the expertise that, that you were you know, talking about there to, 
play the yeah. long and short and do all the active management. And they have real lives, right? They've got a bunch yeah, of other exactly, dividends on their exactly, attention. Exactly, exactly. But you got to find a good financial advisor who understands all the macro issues that you've been talking about here. And that actually really narrows the field a lot. So yep. Matt, um, at the end of this video, we're going to have one of our financial advisors come on. They're going to do a little bit of reaction to what you said. And then they're going to talk about what the markets have done over the past week. These are the guys, uh, the ones from New Harbor, who are very focused on capital preservation, yeah. hedging. They're yeah. currently positioned very much like the way that you just mentioned. So mm -hmm. uh, I did not know what your answer was going to be when I asked <laughs> you that question. I'm just going to let you know, you're probably going to get a really nice fruit basket in the mail from the guys at New Harbor. Okay. <laughs> you couldn't have right. up any better. <laughs> but, but I agree with everything that you said there um, from a, a principal right. standpoint. Um, well, look, we, we've, we've gone... We've gone the hour. If you've got a minute or, or two left in you, I just want to get mm -hmm. to the question I sort of mentioned once mm -hmm. or twice earlier, which mm -hmm. is, uh, by the way, it's always a total pleasure talking to you, Matt. Thank you yeah, for likewise. another yeah. great discussion and so much time. Um, but about the social side of this, right? So mm -hmm. if we play out this arc, right, um, of uh, continuously, every time we get into crisis, that's caused by the ever mounting debt that we have, right? I mean, we, we have a, our, our current fiat monetary system borrows money into existence. So the longer the current system runs, just mathematically, the more debt is going to be brought into existence, right? Mm -hmm. At mm -hmm. some point that has a terminus, right? Where uh, it, it just doesn't work for enough people, right? And you, mm -hmm. you sort of gave nod to this earlier, which is, you know, Pal has this stealth, you know, secret real inflation plan that he's going to plan on doing, right? Where officially, mm -hmm. if you look at it, it looks like he's beating inflation, but in the real world, right, using the old Volcker math, mm -hmm. it's actually negative real rates. And that's helping the Fed kind of inflate away the debt, right? Mm -hmm. um, that will work up until the point um, there's enough people who just get pushed out of the prosperity zone and it just doesn't, they can't get by anymore, right? And it's sort of that... Right. You, you, you can you can pee on my leg. Don't, don't pee on my leg and tell me that it's raining, right? Enough people right. say, look, I'm tired of the happy talk about how right. great you're saying things are. I right. literally can't feed my family this month, right. right? And I think that this is sort of, again, a, a reflection of uh, Oliver Anthony's success is a reflection that a, a, a mm -hmm. critical mass of people are getting to this stage, right? Mm -hmm. How much longer we have to go, I don't know. Could be years, could be decades, Right. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But at some point you get to a, po a, a, a point there where the the majority of the populace just has no other option except to say this just isn't working for me. We got to throw the bums out. And you have some sort of social pushback, mm -hmm. some sort of social revolt. And mm -hmm. it can be, you know, we, we, we've seen the French Revolution. We saw what just <laughs> right. happened two years ago in Sri Lanka, where like basically mm -hmm. the entire country showed up at the presidential palace and just dragged the guy out. Right. Mm -hmm. Will it get that bad? Who knows? I don't know. I'm not mm -hmm. trying to be inflammatory. But mm -hmm. do you see a path where we avoid that kind of social mm -hmm. unrest if on this current trajectory? Obviously, there's a best case and a worst case. And, and, and I'll try my best to be an optimist. It's hard for me. It's the cynic I am. But I think optimistically, the, the way to let out some of the pressure was if we had a legitimate democratic system. And and and. The, the Pollyannish answer is let's elect better representatives who are more blunt, honest, and economically savvy than our predecessors. Let's bring in people that really do have profiles and courage and care more about their country than re-election, face austerity, face entitlement cuts, face budget cuts, face military cuts, have better foreign policy, get us out of avoidable proxy wars, which we've, would have been a disaster for us in the world. Um, bring in better uh, elected officials and get us out of this deep state that I was talking about that that Mike Lufgren wrote so brilliantly about. These are not conspiracy theories anymore. Who really is running? Who are the ideologues and the neocons, left or right, who are making policy? If the DNC and the RNC can be reformed so that we can actually pick our official uh, nominees rather than have, frankly, billionaires decide who they're going to prop and then we get to vote for, I think there are many Democrats like to see someone other than Biden, by the way. I think there are plenty of people that might want to see Robert Kennedy Jr. as an example. I'm saying we need to reform the system, not claiming election fraud. I'm just saying let us actually pick better leaders because the the the, the propped up versions we're being handed is an insult to us. It's 
dumb and dumber left and right. We get mediocrity or mediocrity when we have to have third party candidates who can't beat the system, who can't get the legacy, media, who can't get the financing. We don't have a democracy when you have four lobbyists for every elected member of house influencing the decisions of our quote unquote representatives. That is not democracy. So we'd have to have the, the, the optimistic case is we get real leaders. So we don't need pitchforks and Sri Lanka and revolutions and January sixes and broken frustration that just omits itself out. We need more. I mean, Vivek Yamasam, uh, this Vivek is one of the guys, uh, Robert Kenny Jr. is one of the guys. These are smart guys. Whatever you think, they're smart. Um, Ramasamy is, I mean, he's a classic Yale Law School guy. I can see the way his mind works. He's smart. He's evidence-based. He can take both sides. He's got such confidence and such wisdom. It's another billionaire running for office, but I'll take it. It's smarter and better. Or Robert Kane Jr. on the other side. I guess I'm saying one way to solve this is better, really intelligent, economically savvy, blunt speaking leadership. We haven't seen that in a long time. The negative side, and I've said this last time, and this is where I frankly lean to more pessimistically, because this is what history teaches me, and I've said it again, it's a syllogism. Every time in history where you have a debt crisis, whether it's a regime, an empire, or a democracy, it's always followed by a financial crisis. It then is followed by a currency crisis or an inflation crisis, which is always followed by social unrest. And that social unrest is always responded by extreme centralization from the left or the right. And that's what we're seeing right now with mandates, lockdown, censorship, uh, CBDC. I see a trend, you know, the, the silencing of dissent, the, the, the guilty until proven innocent, the smear campaigns against malinformation, the demonization of Tucker Carlson or Russell Brand or Jordan Peterson, left or right. What we're seeing is malinformation that Eric Weinstein talked about is such a threat to these broken, desperate ideologues in power that have destroyed our system through debt and through worthless, expensive wars and trillions spent on alternative energy that has not made us carbon neutral. These forces are preventing other voices and we're seeing more centralization. That's the other real risk. When you have more centralization, that's another way of stopping pitchforks. I think a safer way to stop pitchforks is to let us elect better, more informed people. Let's actually hope that democracy and election still works. As Churchill said, democracy is a mess, but it's better than anything else. Right. I hope it still works. If we just get the same usual suspects in the next election, mediocre one versus mediocre two, we're going to get the same, again, two stirrups, same saddle, riding us right over a cliff. I think we need more than the AOCs of the world, the George Santos of the world, the, uh, come on, Mitch McConnell, bless his heart, but the guy literally stopped speaking for a minute and his mouth dropped. That's not leadership anymore. We don't need to galvanize power to the point where we're insulting each other with leadership that needs to be replaced. Left or right, we need, I, I am agnostic. I want someone who's blunt, who's qualified, and most importantly, who is less interested in their reelection and more interested about rolling up their sleeves and doing the hard work of facing the financial realities this country faces. Right now, I'm seeing a lot of just platitudes and yeah. blah, 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 blah. So however, whatever happens, best case scenario, worst case scenario, it's likely to be messy <laughs> and it's yeah, likely to be painful. Um, one thing that I think... Um, is needed and I think will be needed. Like, I think it will emerge eventually. I just don't know where in the process and, uh, you know, it could be at the very end, who knows, but is this sort of, uh, I'll borrow it from the native Americans, right. But sort of a seventh generations type thinking, right. Mm -hmm. We're, we're right now we're, we're, we're always making sort of political decisions for what everybody needs right now. Right. Oh, you know, we've got this problem. So people are suffering today. Let's do X. Right. Yeah. We need to to shift to this mindset of, yes, we have current needs and issues as a populace, but but we are trying to leave a legacy to our progeny, right? Mm -hmm. And you know what we've pursued for the past forty years has basically been let's just steal as much of our progeny's prosperity and pull it into <laughs> today, right? You're going to need to have a, a shift around that where we say, look, yeah. we're going to have to leave a, you know a chunk of it for tomorrow, and we yeah. are going to have to sacrifice today for a better tomorrow. Yeah. Um, I think that that's what's going to have to emerge at some point here. And it might be after, you know, the conflagration and the ashes, you know, cool. Yeah, but uh, yeah. but at some point, I think it's going to need to emerge. Do you, do you share that opinion? 
Yeah, it's another great quote by uh, Eric Weinstein the other day. He said, the problem is uh, our baby boomers don't love their children. He meant that sarcastically. He says, we're just putting bullet holes in all our life rafts. We're trying to live for ourselves. We're not thinking about the next generation. You know, we're not we're not that great generation of 44. And we're not that generation that's even able to suffer in the Rust Belt during the Depression where we came together as communities or we came together as families. We're splintered and we're divided. And as a country, we can't even unify on, 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 on many things, whether it's foreign policy or whether it's January 6th or whether it's whether vaccines are safe or effective. We're so divided. Um, I don't think BLM is the same as Martin Luther King. I think there's, you know, there's 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 things that have changed for the worse. And there are many great leaders, black, white, straight, not straight, who would agree. We've got to find common ground that we're not getting from our current crop of political leadership and a generation that is thinking more about itself than the next generation. And also a generation that is debating more on emotion than on facts. That's what I like about Vivek, for example. He's evidence based. Facts are stubborn things. You can have your own opinions, but not your own facts. I think we need to get down to facts, to compromise, to cooperation. Again, these all sound Pollyannish. I don't know if that's possible for this generation. There's so much anger. There's so much division. There's so much me first from our musical lyrics to our political thinking to our entitlements. I don't know if that's possible. If the generation is willing to actually sacrifice now for the next generation, especially if it's not their immediate generation. Um, if we're thinking what's best for our country. And if we had a notion of what that vision is, we have a chance. Uh, it's very hard to, to imagine right now, given this, the fragmentation, the fractured nature of our society, the wealth inequality, the genuine and understandable resentment among so many different groups in the society that feel marginalized or feel entitled or feel left out. Uh, it's a it's a pell-mell of psychological, financial, political, and philosophical forces dividing this country that we need uh, the type of people that really can find a common denominator, a common, a common spinal column in this country or in this system that we can all agree on. I don't know. That sounds so Pollyannish to me right now. We need truly heroic, blunt-speaking leadership. And we need truly heroic and blunt speaking uh, population willing to come together like we've done many times in the past when we had a good fight to fight. Right, right. now, we don't even know where to look. Well, I'll, I'll leave you with this bit of, of guarded optimism, which is talking to Neil Howe, you know, the, the demographer of the four turning around this. You know, I sort of asked him, I said, look, you know, I look back at all these other tumultuous times in history and there were these leaders that emerged, right, who were great leaders. Uh, and they they had this platform that everybody could rally around, right? You just you just can't be against everything. You actually have right. to be a, you know for something that's constructive that that right. people realize is a good that they want to fight for, right? right? And I said like I'm not seeing that many right now. Is it just that we have a really bad crop this year of leaders or this this time of leaders, or have they have things just not gotten so bad that they haven't emerged yet? And he said it's much more the latter. He said mm -hmm. most of the leaders that come out during these periods are very reluctant. They weren't people that sort of sought the role, and right. it's like the pressure of you know the earth that that forces coal into becoming a diamond, right? Where it yeah. just once the yeah. pressures get hard enough, the leaders do emerge. Now, the, the, the cost of getting the great leader is the pain that precedes it, right? Yeah, so, yeah, you know, things yeah. may need to get a lot worse before we get some some better leaders. But but Neil yeah. was actually surprisingly confident that from what he's seen repeating back in history is that they will come. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just maybe going to be at a pretty high price. <laughs> I hope he's right. Look, you know, there's a famous quote by Lenin. You know, I didn't create the revolution. I just followed it. I just captured it. There goes the crowd. I'll follow. Mm -hmm can be it can be great leaders or dangerous leaders there can be demagogues or there can be gandhis or you know kennedy right I, yeah. it's, it's sorry to interrupt but just to let you respond peter atwater yeah. who i was interviewing at the same time around this yeah. you know his big worry about social inequality is, is what could happen in terms of who we do elect to address it because he said if you stand out in the cold rain long enough you'll get in the car with anyone yeah yeah well that's just it and look at franco or you know, look at Mussolini, look at Hitler, look at Lenin, look at Stalin. In other words, in, in moments of weakness and fissures and desperation, some real dangerous characters can come in or you can get some great leaders. To your point, it's the ones who almost have no choice but to do it because they want to do it because they have to. They don't want to. And again, I'm not trying to push RFK Jr., but God bless him. He doesn't need the money. He doesn't need the fame. He certainly isn't arrogant and vain. He actually, I truly sincerely believes he's worried about this country. He comes from 
a father who was assassinated, an uncle who was assassinated. He has risks. He's already had a th threats on his own life. He can't even get airtime on the legacy media. He, I don't agree with everything he says, but one thing I know, what I strongly believe is he's sincere. Whatever he says may be his truth, but I know he means it. He's not just filling air to fill air. He has a genuine conviction. That's refreshing. Uh, do others candidates have it lesser or more? I don't know. Um, and, you know, I, I'm not sure, but I think someone like that, a version of that is refreshing. I mean, even Cornell West is running. He's another extreme. He was my professor at Harvard, my favorite professor, my favorite man. I think he's he's I don't agree with everything he says either. I'll say this about Cornell West. He believes it and he's he's smart as a whip and he has a hundred percent passion. That kind of passion, whether it's Cornell West or Robert Kennedy Jr. or Vivek Yamaswamy, because I think Vivek is sharp as a tack. I mean, I've seen this kind of kid in classrooms before. He's dangerously smart. And I'd be excited to see any of those three would be better than any of the usual suspects we have right now. But again, do we get great leadership or do we get demagogues? That's the real that's the that's the scary point. You know, do we get demagogues or do we get, you know, Thomas Jefferson's and James Madison's and Thomas Payne's and, you know, John Adams's, you know, well, let's pray pastor. for the latter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Let's pray exactly. for that. And no matter what happens, you know, it's going to take a long time and you will have many, many bites at this apple coming on this program yeah. to discuss. Matt, thanks yeah. for giving us so much time. Um, so appreciate it. Great discussion as always. Um, for folks that have really enjoyed the discussion, maybe this is the first video of you that they've seen and they're getting introduced mm -hmm. to you. Where can they go to learn more about you and your work? Uh, well, our URL is goldswitzerland.com. Uh, we're Matterhorn Asset Management and all of my articles and interviews are posted on, on that website and it talks about our service. Yeah, we're, we're, we're really about wealth preservation. Um, our minimums are very high. Uh, but we talk about gold for all audiences, you know, uh, but we privately store physical gold and silver outside of the banking system in jurisdictions other than your home country in the safest vault in the world, because we're about wealth preservation and currency risk. And uh, that's why uh, we have a singular, very singular focus. Um, but anything that I'm thinking about or writing about can be found there. And my partner and colleague, Egon von Greyers, who's an iconic figure in the precious metal space, uh, his articles and interviews are there as well. So you can get a, you can get a very uh, good education on precious metals on that website as well. All right. Well, folks, look, uh, if you're interested in hearing more about Matt's thoughts, definitely go there. Um, Matt doesn't give a ton of interviews. So Matt, I really appreciate you coming on this channel. Um, and folks, uh, you know, if you, uh, if you'd like to see Matt come back on this channel more often, please do us a favor, let us know in the comment <laughs> section below. But I think the, uh, I think I already know it's going to be strong enough, Matt, that you've got an open invitation to come here anytime that you've got an important message you want to get out. I always enjoy it, Adam. It really is a genuine pleasure. It's a good informal conversation. It's great. Necessary. All right. Well, look, thanks so much for coming on, buddy. Can't wait to have you back on again soon. Okay. Take care. All right. Well, now's the time in the program where we bring in the lead partners from New Harbor Financial, one of the endorsed advisory firms by Wealthion. I'm joined today by lead partner, Mike Preston. John Loder has the week off. Mike, great to see you. Very curious to hear your reactions to Matt's uh, interview there. Uh, Matt gave a long, uh, in many ways, uh, sort of diatribe or litany of a lot of the issues I know you guys at New Harbor and you personally are pretty passionate about. And as I, I sort of joked uh, you know, near the end of the interview there, uh, he basically gave you guys about the best setup I think anyone could have given you guys, given your approach to investing in capital management. Uh, and, and actually, in many ways, how your portfolio is currently allocated. So what were your key takeaways? Well, thanks, Adam. I really like that talk from from uh, Matt. Uh, he speaks the same language that, that we do. He pulls no punches on criticizing the Fed and other central banks. Uh, we, we agree broadly with his sentiments here in that he says a hard landing is here. Enough with the, with the de debate about whether we have a hard landing or soft landing. We're in a hard landing right now. The policies and, and, and the methods that are being used right now are emergency methods and procedures. And we've been living in this really for 15 years, probably a little bit more than that. But certainly since the 2008 financial crisis, it's been just an ever increasing amount of liquidity and debt issuance and more and more and more. And there really is no plan B. It's only this. Um Matt talks about it being like the global Truman Show. 
you really wonder if you're crazy or not. Are you seeing things right? Is the data correct? Is the data ever going to mean anything? You know, we have we have valuations that are beyond the uh, the most extreme in history. We've got Schiller PE ratios up in the mid 30s. If you adjust them for margins, we're in the 40s. Um, you know, we've got a debt situation that is unsustainable. Matt talks about once debt to GDP gets above 120 percent. Really, you can't grow your way out of the problem. You, you have just a few different choices. You have to basically um, cut spending by 40 percent. You know, do nothing, have more bank failures, that type of thing over time. Or, you know, lastly, there's the magic mouse click that he talked about, the magic mouse click. And this is what our, our central bankers have opted to do. It's probably what they're going to do in the future. They've proven that they don't really have any other plan. And um, I can't say that I'm happy about it, but the Fed now has some ammunition. As Matt talked about, there's ammo in, in both in both weapons. And that federal funds rate is up in the you know five and a half or so. And there's actually a reduction in the Fed balance sheet down to, you know, from 10 trillion at its highest, it's it's eight point something now. So there's a tiny, tiny drop in um, the, the balance sheet, which would give them, give the Fed some am, am, ammunition to pivot. But we agree with Matt that they're not going to pivot until there's some market crash. I heard Matt say that he thinks we might see a 30 to 40% drop in the market before the Fed pivots. We completely agree. And, you know, I've been on record to, to say that I think this market could trade more than 50% below where we are now, or even two thirds below the all time high in January of 2022. We could see sub 2000 on the S&P and still not be at fair value or still not be undervalued. We might be at more, um, we might be closer to fail, fair value if we were below 2000. So uh, just a couple more things and then I'll pause because I've got so many notes. Um, Matt talks a lot about how in society we have cynicism and distrust of the sis, uh, of the system. We've got young people saying that the, or feeling like the boomers have taken all of the opportunity. And we, ha we have had the largest wealth transfer, I think, in modern history because of these policies. And it's not a good thing. So we try to talk about the ills of central bank policy and how, um, you know, these types of focuses are going to hurt our future, certainly have hurt our markets. We don't have free markets. And uh, it sounds like a, a broken record, I know, a lot of times because we've been talking about it for years. But it was very refreshing to hear Matt talk about it. So I'll, I'll take a pause there. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, uh, you know during the the live premiere of part one with Matt in the live chat, um, you know there are a lot of people uh, in the live chat who were saying, you know, hey, thank goodness someone's actually saying, you know, what I've been thinking. Um, people really appreciated his ability to give voice to. I think a lot of the the narratives that are running inside, you know, I think the the average sane person's mind. Uh, but they don't get talked about on, uh, you know, in, in the media, which was a big part of Matt's uh, Matt's whole point there. Um, all right. So uh, so anyways, you know, Matt talked a lot about, um, I mean, at the end of the day, it always comes down to debt, right? Uh, we've got way too much debt. Uh, history has shown that uh, every time a, a nation, a country, a society has gotten, uh, you know, overly indebted, uh, they're faced with that choice that you mentioned there earlier, right? It's it's basically either austerity uh, or you 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 get to uh, sacrificing your currency. And he said, you know, invariably, always, without exception, uh, in the end, it's always the currency that is sacrificed. Uh, and I think that's because um, uh, the math is cruel, right? You know, you get to a point where implementing the austerity is so painful that no politician is ever going to get elected to do it. Um, but also humans being who they are, you know, no politician uh, is going to avoid the siren sound of uh, of money creation because it, it it kicks the can off to tomorrow, right? And eventually you get to a point where tomorrow arrives and you, you can't avoid the repercussions. But at that point in time, it's way too long, way too late to have uh, salvaged the system, anyways, right? And so Matt's basically saying we're seeing history repeat right now, um, and so you know that's why he's so confident about uh, the longer term arc 
of how this process is going to go, right? Which is largely currency destruction, more inflation, eventually at some point in the future, hyperinflation. Um, and I, I, I believe, Mike, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I, I believe you probably concur with him in that, that longer term view. Now, of course, um, <clears throat> that's, that's an outlook that, you know, Matt and others may have a lot of confidence in, um, but they don't know the timing and they don't necessarily know the exact trajectory of the path. So, you know, as Matt and I talked about briefly, you know, you can have deflationary impulses and corrections on the way to that that long-term endpoint. And so you can't just necessarily position today for uh, the long-term arc of, okay, you know, the fiat currencies are going to be worth a lot less going forward. So I'm going to park in, in you know, these assets. Um, because the problem is, is you can get wiped out along the way during, you know, the, the zigs and zags as we go along this process. Um, I do want to ask you in just a few minutes about what's going on in the markets right now, because um, you know we're 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 seeing a lot of weakness in the markets here, and and we may uh, we may be seeing uh, you know one of these impulses come along here, where you know maybe there maybe the correction that sort of started the summer that we thought was over, maybe begins to build steam back up again. We've got the dollar, the U.S. dollar, uh, at an all time high for the year. It's been on an absolute tear since mid July. Um, we've got U.S. Treasury rates up uh, north of 4.5% right now. Uh, and just to really stir the pot, uh, <laughs> uh, J.P. Morgan CEO uh, Jamie Dimon came out and uh, said, you know, I could see interest rates go into 7%. And I think investors need to prepare for that. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's <clears throat> I, I laugh. It's more of a gallows humor laugh, but like, Seven percent. I just I, I I don't know what the world would look like. Sadly, today under seven percent interest rates, because I just don't think the system can hold together for very long during that time. So, would love to get some of your thoughts on here, Mike, because you, as a financial advisor, you uh, are a steward of client capital, right? And so, I know you guys are favorable gold and whatnot, um, uh, which of course is Matt's really big trade for the the long time, you know. The, the long arc uh, devolution of the currency purchasing power, but you've got to keep your clients, you know, solvent and protected along the way. So, you know, you've got to prepare for these, you know, price dislocations in the market, maybe some of these disinflationary or deflationary downdrafts, maybe a return of a, a bear market in the financial markets. So uh, with all that, how are you guys preparing for all this right now? Yeah, I'll respond to that in a couple different ways. Um... From a couple different angles, Adam. I mean, it's it's been a maddening fifteen years or ten years. Let, you know, let me just say that that all of the things we're talking about today, you could easily talk about ten years ago, and many of us were. Um, it's just that things have gotten more extreme, and that's the common complaint that people would say about anyone that tries to be tactical. Uh, is that well, you can't time the market, so just join them. The problem is that everyone's joined them uh, at a higher valuation that we've than we've ever seen, and there's no mathematical way to make positive returns in the next ten or fifteen years from these levels. We have to all hope that this time is different. We have to believe in magical money printing, and we have to believe that that will persist. And so, I think now more than ever in the last at least one hundred plus hundred years, at least. We're really being forced to pick a side here. You believe that this is some new paradigm, or you basically, you know, you basically say that this isn't right, and you walk away from the game to some extent. And you know what Matt's talking about there is, to some extent, walking away from the game, uh, being patient, putting your money in gold, silver, other real assets. It's very aligned with what we've been talking about. Uh, we have for many years said that this game is uh is is not free or fair or a real market much anymore and therefore we've been very very cautious and we've advised our clients to invest five or ten percent of their assets in gold and silver i do believe that what we've witnessed here um, was a market top on january 4th of 2022 in the s p and i will start to share some charts in a minute just talk about that but i i think that we've seen the largest blow off top in history post covid and it only stands to reason that we're seeing one of the largest topping processes ever 
And um, I, I think I'll start by at this moment sharing some charts so we can just talk through them. So the first one that's coming up here is just going to be the S&P 500. This is the S&P 500 on a weekly basis, uh, just a, a typical uh, candlestick chart. I'll go to the month actually first and then come back here. So this is the post-COVID blow-off top that I talked about that took us to the most extremely overvalued level in history. And then in 2022, we had a very contained decline, followed by a 45-degree bounce off the October low. I believe that this recent swing high is a counter trend bounce or a bear market rally. Or if you're using Elliott Wave type um, analysis, it would be a wave two rally. And I think that what we're, what we're seeing now is a, an acceleration of the next move or wave down that will bring us pretty quickly down to about 4,100, I think. Now, nothing's guaranteed in technical analysis, but this is what it looks like on a on a weekly chart. And I'll admit that right here on a weekly chart, this looked like a cup and handle that was consolidating. And we were at risk for, for if we had one big up week, we would have a breakout from the cup and handle and then you know, potentially one more big blow off top. We made some changes to our hedges. We actually closed our inverse hedges and replaced them with an at the money uh, put option a couple of weeks ago. And that would limit our losses if we got that blow off top and yet still keep our hedge in place. What's actually happened is we've broken down here in the short term. I'll go to the daily chart. And we have completed what's called a head and shoulders formation. This line here, this uh, denotes the head and shoulders. This would be the left shoulder, the head, and then a complex or double right shoulder. When we close below here, we confirmed. And if, if technical analysis were to work in this case, we'd come right down to about 4,100. I believe there's much greater um, you know, potential downside moves after that. So a couple more points I'd like to point out and then and then pause. Um, the Russell 2000, so the S&P is up around 11% year to date. And I'm going to stop this share so I can share one more thing here. Um, the S&P is up about 11% year to date. And show this slide here can you see this one now this is basically yep. showing the s p is up 11 percent. the equal weighting index is up basically well the equal weighting index is basically flat and the magnificent seven is eight you know up 81 percent. so the markets are pretty flat the s p itself is up only around 11 percent, and the equal weighted index is flat on the year right meaning it's the magnificent seven that are doing all of the lifting for the uh, the indices. That's exactly right. So I've got to go right back to the, the S&P here just to show you that I believe that we're going to see a breakdown here to 4,100 and then further. The Russell 2000 as well is flat on the year. Here's the Russell 2000. This dotted line is the beginning of the year. The Russell 2000 has been weaker in the last couple of months and it is flat on the year. So in meanwhile, our short-term indicators have reversed into um, bearish uh, bearish mode or telling us to be cautious and um, when we adjusted our hedge a couple weeks ago we actually raised our cash uh, position to about 50 just over 50 percent so we're about 50 50 uh, to 52 percent depending upon the actual account there's some variation uh, in accounts that's in short-term treasury bills earning over five percent we've got a total equity exposure of about 20 percent 15% in emerging markets, 5% in industrials, but 15% of that is hedged away with the put option that we just talked about. I will stop sharing here for a moment. Uh, actually, before I do that, let's take a quick look at gold because you mentioned gold. This is a chart of gold that I talk about over and over again, and it's like watching paint dry. It's really, really boring. And, you know, gold has been stuck below $2,000 an ounce here for a while. But on this 20-year chart, you can see this giant cup and handle form formation followed by a triple top. Triple tops don't usually stick, so I really think we're going to break out to the upside here. But in the near term, it's been frustrating. You know, gold is weak again today. 
we're down at around 1900 down about uh 20 something dollars or so today it looks like but still I, you know i think that matt gives the right message patience get out of the market hold cash hold gold and you know lastly short term i think that we're starting to see some reason to believe that we may finally get an acceleration to the downside on the s p that head and shoulders formation has confirmed we'll see what happens in the next week or two but you know i can tell you volatility has been low worry has been low everyone kind of thinks this market's just going to keep going forever and the fed is magic but i think that's a you know a perfect type of complacency that's extremely extremely uh, dangerous here well it, it, it is for many reasons we've talked in the past but but one of the reasons why it is particularly in a market environment like you just showed us is um you know market reversals happen with a change in sentiment where it's you know at the margin all of a sudden people going from being net bullish to net bearish right and we've had a lot of of um complacency or optimism in the market right we talked about how at the beginning of the year everybody was was so so into the fear side of things and was so sure that we were going to have a a recession early this year and then that morphed into a well maybe we're going to have a soft landing and then oh gosh we're probably not going to have any landing at all right and uh that's flying you know in the face of an increasing amount of data as as matt went on his diatribe about um but you know you just showed us the chart of the S&P, how it's actually really, you know, kind of starting to weaken a fair amount here. We've got that confirmed head and shoulders. If we indeed cross that Rubicon where people are no longer net bullish and they're now net bearish, right? That's when you can get, you know, fear coming back in the system and really driving the market action, right? So we're already seeing the markets weaken, like you said, uh, equal weighted. The market's flat. It's actually even slightly down for the year, right? You know, if, if all of a sudden we start seeing people start taking cards off the table and they start taking some money out of those magnificent seven stocks, the bottom could fall pretty darn quickly here. Uh, now, it's interesting because we've had a number of people on the, the program here recently talking about how um, markets tend to, you know, have one last gasp before uh, a big correction happens uh, or you go into a recession. Um, I think a real interesting debate is, you know, um, are, are, are we still, are, is that last gasp ahead of us, right? And is what's going on right now a little bit of a bear trap where bears think, okay, this is it. And then all of a sudden the markets, you know, surprise everybody and go back up again and steamroll the bears. Or is the action that we saw running into the summer to the July highs, was, was that the last gasp, right? I don't know, TBD, but we'll we'll be watching it really closely from here. Um, I just want to get back to, two of the things I mentioned there. You know, so first, let's talk about the US dollar strength for a second. So that's obviously got to be weighing on gold a bit, right? You were showing that gold was down actually now to about 1900. So gold has kind of been taking its licks of late here. And the, the increasing US dollar price doesn't help because it doesn't have to be. They sometimes will trade apart from each other, but much more often than not, gold and the US dollar trade inversely. Also, a strengthening US dollar tends to weigh on equities. Um, in, in large part because it's harder for uh, companies to sell their products to foreign markets when the dollar gets overly strong, right? And we saw a lot of that going on, uh, you know, a year plus ago, and we may now be back in that territory. I mean, the dollar is over 106 now, right? So that can't be helpful for markets. Um, and then we'll talk about interest rates in just a moment, because obviously high interest rates aren't good uh, for the consumer and good for markets in the long run either. But looking at the dollar, Mike, what, what are you thinking these days? Yeah, I want to bring up a, sh a chart of the dollar so we can talk through that. You know, we, we agree with Brent Johnson and, and the whole dollar milkshake theory that the dollar will probably get stronger in the near term, You know, particularly in an economic crisis. <laughs> or a market crash, there's probably going to be a flood into the dollar. I don't think it deserves it, but I think that's likely what's going to happen. And I think we've said that for a long time. Here's a monthly chart of the dollar. I always like to really step back and take a, a big picture look. It's easy to get stuck in the noise and really confused. The big picture is the dollar had a nice big kind of blow off, you know, vertical move last year. And then a big pullback. And so, you know, we went to around 115 or so. I believe, you know, I believe that Brent is right, like I mentioned before, and that we're probably going to go to a new high in the dollar, you know, maybe 120 or plus, or, or even north of that. 
but particularly if we get some kind of market meltdown and there's a lot of worry in the world I and mean, everyone's going to have to go to the dollar. It's the whole euro dollar thing and the, and the many tens of trillions of dollars of collateral that are out there. So longer term, you know, I think that the, that there's a lot of reasons to be concerned about the dollar. The recent BRICS summit in South Africa on August 24th and the fact that, you know, the Fed has to choose. You know, the Fed has to choose. And, you know, I, we agree with Matt that the Fed is going to probably choose the magic mouse button. But they're not going to do that before some kind of market drop or crash. And they're not going to do that before some kind of crisis. Um, so when so I would think the most likely thing is a dollar will go higher in the near term and then longer term. And so maybe between now and two years from now, the dollar might go higher. And then longer term, you might see the a, a long 10 year decline in the in the in the dollar. That doesn't mean that gold can't go up at the same time. It's pretty impressive that gold is actually doing okay, even with the dollar moving from roughly 100 to 106. If I go back to the, the gold chart here, you'll see I mean, gold has hung in there pretty well. You know, it's one, two, it's about seven months here of this consolidation with the slight down bias. But it really hasn't taken it on the chin too much as the dollar has had this sharp up move. If I go to the weekly chart now, you'll see that the dollar has been, you know, what do we have here? Basically 5, 10, 11 straight up weeks. 11 straight up weeks. I can't find another winning streak that's quite as good as that. So the dollar is actually quite strong here, um, you know, and, and particularly with interest rates up at 5.5% on short-term T-bills. A lot of money is flooding in. And we think it's a good opportunity for people to just sit back and, you know, sit back and wait. You know, as I mentioned earlier, over 50% of our model right now is in treasury bills. We don't love that. We don't want to be there. We want to earn much more than that. We want to earn 8, 10, 12% for our clients. But the S&P would have to be much lower than it is today to do that. So again, well, who, who knows? Maybe, and, maybe not, only because I'm just going to bring this up here. Yeah, I mentioned this earlier. You know, Jamie Dimon says Americans are on an economic sugar high, right? And I think, you know, Matt and many of the folks I interviewed this week would agree. And he's urging clients to batten down the hatches and prepare for rates to hit 7%. So if mm. he's right there, Mike, you might be able to get 7% for your clients just by sitting in the safety of short-term details. Yeah, and we would be the, you know, the first to admit that we'd want to do that for a big chunk. I don't think that rates are going to stay there. I don't know. It's amazing to me. I'm watching this. I'm watching the bond market. We haven't talked much about bonds, but bond the bond market's been in absolute meltdown mode, complete capitulation, you know, and mortgage, and that's causing mortgage rates to go up. Mortgage rates are seven and a half to seven and three quarters, yet home prices are hardly budging. It's quite a perplexing spot right now. We're talking to clients all the time and they're like, what is going on? How is the market holding in there? I mean, the, the stock market is still where it was a year and a half ago when the Fed started raising rates, yet bonds have lost nearly half their value. So something isn't right. And, you know, it's our opinion that stocks are going to have to correct. And frankly, the Fed needs them to correct and in a big way so that they can do what they want to do. All right. So and that's kind of where I'm going. And then we'll end on this, which is, um, uh, you know, I remember, Mike, a year ago, right, a little over a year ago, having interviews with people where we were talking about the Fed's hiking regime, and they were like, there is no way the Fed's going to get above 3%, <laughs> with the Fed funds rate. Mm -hmm. They're just like, there's just no way. The economy can't take it. Things will break down. Um, uh, here we are at five and a quarter, right? And I've talked a bit about this year about how, to a certain extent, the fiscal side of the equation has come to the rescue with all the deficit spending that Congress has been doing. Um, I was talking to uh, Alf Pecatiello yesterday, uh, and uh, he basically said that 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 is is going to end, uh, and basically it's ending now. That the uh, uh, most of of the uh, funds that the administration had gotten approval to spend, um, much of that spending is is expiring uh, now in October and needs to be renewed. Uh, and certainly unclear whether it's going to get renewed by a divided Congress right now. And of course, with an election year coming up, the Republicans will probably do everything they can to stymie uh, additional uh, additional stimulus from the administration. 
Um, so if that's true, if that supports, you know, getting pulled off of here, um, then uh, the, the full gravitational force of those higher rates, you know, really can start manifesting on the economy. And if those rates continue to go higher, right, if diamonds correct and we start getting 7% interest rates, I agree with you. I don't think they can stay there for very long. I'm amazed the economy is holding together at five and a quarter percent. I have no idea how it continues at 7%. And again, I keep using this analogy of like turning up the force of gravity as interest rates go up. But the, I think the housing market's already a dead man walking. But boy, if we take interest rates up to 7%, I mean, that could really be, I can't see how that can't be what fully breaks the housing market and really starts sending prices plummeting. So uh, it's going to be really interesting to see what happens from all that. Of course, then the question will be how much, um, uh, how much will the Fed expend when it rides to the rescue? Although I will say, I've talked to a number of people recently who say, because the Fed is, is playing for its credibility here, it's not going to pivot on a dime uh, if markets start going down hard. Um, it's going to wait until essentially it's, it's got to wait for one of two things. It's got to wait for inflation to be under its 2% target because Powell has been, he, he's put his reputation on the line that that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to keep going until inflation's subdued. And for him, subdued is below 2%. Um, or they think the Fed will, will really only pivot once it has the air cover to do so because the world has shown up on its door begging the Fed to pivot. And so for that to happen, it's going to take a fair amount of pain in the markets. So for those folks that are expecting the Fed just to, to ride in at the first sign of, of market uncomfortableness, um, you know, folks I've been talking to recently say that should not be your default expectation. You actually should be expecting a fair amount of pain before the, the Fed lets itself get drag, gets dragged back into stimulating if inflation is not below 2%, which doesn't look likely anytime soon. Yeah, the Fed has too much power, Adam. I think that we all agree that with that, and they shouldn't be the fourth arm of the the fourth branch of the U.S. government, but they are. You know, they they've got to be careful. You're right; they need air cover so that they can return to return to you know providing liquidity because without it, the debt pile is not serviceable. I think that's the easiest way to that, put that's it. That's Matt's whole thesis there, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I could say it in one sentence. You know, that's that's it. Uh, but they have to be careful because it's the set of conditions here could lead to an out of control situation where the crash is much worse than might be expected. And if that's the case, then it may be clear that we're 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 seeing the deflation of the third bubble in the last 25 years. And it could become clear that the Fed is the problem in the in the first place. You know, the, the Fed creates bubbles and they fix bubbles. And what happens in the meantime is a lot of psychological stress on people. And, you know, also what happens in the meantime is a vast amount of wealth uh, dispersion. That's not that's not fair. So, you know, in a way, I hope that we have some kind of economic uh, um, accident. I don't want people to suffer, that's for sure. But what I, what I do want is a little more freedom in the markets and a little more talk and discourse about what our central banks are doing. And so, you know, in that light, I, I hope that we do see a down market and I hope that we do see more discussion about what the Fed is doing. And, you know, I know that Matt says that people talk like this are labeled doomers or gold bugs. But, you know, I think that this is not really a free market that much. So um, I think it would be helpful. All right. All right, folks. Well, look, um, we're going to leave it there, except, Mike, I'll just ask, have you guys made any trades recently uh, in your portfolio that are worth flagging for folks? Yeah, I'm glad you asked, Adam. We haven't, you know, we've been on full on defense for a number of uh, weeks and, and even months, although a couple months ago, there was some signs that, that that said that we could get offensive, but that has been wiped away with this recent downturn the last couple of weeks. So um, we're still quite, you know, heavy in cash equivalents. Uh, we have made one adjustment this week that I'd like to point out. Um, TLT. I mentioned earlier is a you know has been getting has been getting hammered and I might try to share the chart one last time quickly yeah, if you can I believe it's below it's in the eighties now right yeah TLT is right here eighty eight forty two all right so we have actually just adjusted a hedge we had 
um, a couple different things going on with this, but it's amazing how much this is sold off. Just go into the monthly chart. Look at March of last year when the Fed started uh, when the Fed started tightening. You know, we've lost forty something percent from then. We've lost over fifty percent from the high, and you know, all of this while the S and P is hardly hardly budged. And we didn't enter TLT until after this big drop. Of course, it's gotten worse from there. And we have used options a lot of different ways to uh, to make the situation better. But going to the weekly chart, uh, back here when we started to break down, we took a 50% hedge on the position. We sold the October 106 calls. And with that money, we bought the October 98 puts. Well, on this capitulation that we just had, we just took profit on the 98 put and we don't know where the bottom actually is here but we actually sold the 98 put and i'm just going to change this to 92 and we rebought the 92 put so effectively we took some of this profit out and we moved this put down to 92 on that half so if the position's still a loser we're fully aware of that the position is down but we want people to understand that we have maximum a 15% position on that's now seven and a half or has been for quite some time because the put was in the money. And, and on the other half, we're selling calls on it pretty religiously to pull an income. And we maintain put protection on half of it still even here. So at some point, I believe this is going to bounce mightily and it's going to be, um, I think we'll look back and say that we were able to sit through it a little bit better with the option hedges. So we did just make that adjustment this week. And uh, thanks for asking if we made any changes. All right. And thanks for walking me through that. Cause I, I, it's super important for people to see how a professional financial advisor actually manages their position. So when you want to be in a, an instrument, let's say TLT, right? You're not just buying it and closing your eyes and crossing your fingers. You know, you are using options, not as a speculative tool, but as a risk mitigation tool where you are buying downside insurance and it sounds like some of that's already paid off for you, right? Mm -hmm. So yes, you wish TLT had gone up, but it went down enough that your put got in the money. And so, you know, that insurance is, is subsidizing your loss, which is, which is great for you. So your clients are experiencing a, a much lower loss than they would have before. And along the way, you're selling calls. So that's bringing in income, right? And your risk there is that, TLT goes off to the races suddenly and, uh, you know, before you can get those calls covered and, uh, you know, all, all that happens is, is you miss out on some of the excess upside, but it's all, it's all goodness basically for your clients. So, yep, um, great. so I just want, I, I just want to make folks, if you, if you didn't follow what Mike said there, go, go back and rewatch it. Cause it's really useful to show you how you can still be in a position and still have, the vast majority of the upside exposure to it, but you can have really important downside exposure if you're using hedges intelligently the way that the guys at New Harbor does. Okay, yeah. great. Well, in wrapping up from there, um, two quick things before we go. Um, one, just want to remind folks that the October 21st uh, Fall Online Conference for Wealthion is coming up. Uh, the faculty uh, is the best we've ever had, and it just keeps getting better and better. Uh, just had Jeff Clark sign on, so he's going to uh, give his um, uh, a presentation on his preferred uh, precious metals mining companies. And we didn't get a chance to talk that much about it this week, Mike. But you know, we did before the camera was rolling, where you know you reiterated, "Wow, they're they're, they're still really beaten up here, and there's some great values emerging." Uh, and that you know, if and when that space catch fires, there's a lot of great money to be made. Um, Jeff is going to be sharing, you know, his specific companies as well as, you know, specific tickers and whatnot that you can go uh, investigate. Um, so anyways, to learn more about the conference and register for it, go to wealthion.com slash conference. And as a reminder, if you do so quickly, you can still catch the uh, our lowest uh, discounted price, which is I think it's 29% off of the full uh, ticket price. And if you're an alumnus of our previous conferences, go check out your email inbox. You should have an email from me in there somewhere with a discount code that'll give you an additional 15% discount to that. Lastly, and I think Mike did a really good job uh, of presenting it this week, and Matt did a phenomenal job. Of, you know, given everything that's going on right now, given that we are, you know, we very well may be in a hard landing and just not admitting it to ourselves yet. Uh, if you're an average person trying to figure out how do I not become, how does my portfolio not become collateral damage to all of this? Um, 
highly recommend you work with a professional financial advisor who's good, number one, but also number two, very importantly, takes into account all of the macro issues that Matt and I talked about and that Mike and I talked about here. If you've got a good one who's doing that for you and then implementing that uh, along the way and keeping you well informed, great. You should stick with them. They are very rare. If you don't have one, you'd like a second opinion from one who does, maybe even Mike uh, and uh, his team there at New Harbor, um, then consider scheduling a free consultation with one of the financial advisors that Wealthion endorses. To do that, just fill out the short form at Wealthion.com. Only takes you a couple seconds. These consultations are totally free. There's no commitment to work with these guys. It's just a free public service that these financial advisors offer to help as many people as possible, position as prudently as, as possible in advance of a number of the things that we talked about here. Um, Mike, thanks so much, buddy. Um, folks, if you enjoy uh, having Matt on the program, want to have him come back on as soon as he's able to, um, please do me a favor. Uh, show him your support for that by hitting the like button, then clicking on the red subscribe button below as well as that little bell icon right next to it. Thanks for joining me for this week, Mike. Look forward to seeing you again next week. I'll let you have the last word as we walk folks out here. Just glad to be here. Glad to be here. We really think things are coming to a culmination. Uh, we've learned a lot of humility over the years, though, so I don't know for sure. But um, it's going to matter at some point, and it's probably going to matter in a very surprising way uh, when people least expect it. And we're seeing short-term signs of caution here. So, you know, be 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 cautious. And uh, if you want to talk, we're here to talk, uh, whether you're a client or not. Uh, we're happy to have a chat with you and, and give you our you know, our best unbiased advice. So thanks for having us on, Adam. We really appreciate it. And thanks, everyone, for watching. All right. Thanks so much, Mike. See you next week. Everyone else, thanks so much for watching. If you'd like to schedule a consultation with one of the financial advisors at New Harbor Financial, simply go to Wealthion.com. These consultations are completely free and there are no strings attached. The good folks at New Harbor will simply answer any questions you have about your investment goals or your portfolio and give you their best advice given their latest market outlook. They're willing to do this because they care about protecting people's wealth and because Wealthion has connected them with so many thoughtful investors just like you over the past decade. We started doing this because so many people have approached us in frustration looking for a solution because they're feeling out of alignment or downright ridiculed by the standard financial advisors who have been managing their money. You know the type. The kind that just pushes all of your money into the market, scoffs at the idea of owning gold, and when you bring up concerns about the market's sky-high valuations, they say, don't worry, the market will always take care of you. For many of the reasons discussed in today's video, we think this is one of the most challenging and treacherous times in history for investing. We strongly believe that today's investors are best served working in partnership with a conscientious professional financial advisor who understands the risks in play. Now, we're agnostic which professional advisor you work with, as long as they're good. If you're already working with one, that's fantastic. Stick with them. But if you don't, or are having trouble finding one you respect or trust, then consider talking to John and Mike and the team at New Harbor. Now, for those about to ask, yes, there's a business relationship between Wealthion and New Harbor, which we put in place to make sure everything is handled according to SEC regulations. All the details on this are clearly provided on the Wealthion.com website. Also, it's important to note that New Harbor is able to work with U.S. citizens, green card holders, and those with existing assets in the USA. But for regulatory reasons, they aren't able to take on non-U.S. clients. All right. With all that said, if you'd like some insight and guidance on how to protect your wealth during this unprecedented time in the markets, go to Wealthion.com to schedule your free consultation with the good folks at New Harbor. Thanks for watching.